Hi, this is Kevin with NursingCamp.com, and this is my neuro course on myasthenia gravis, which I cover the seven most important things about this condition and the management of it. It not only includes the videos, but my study sheets found on NursingCamp.com and my clinical resources. Follow me on social media on NursingCamp.com, and well, let's get into it. <music> All right, this is what we should know about myasthenia gravis, but I cover the seven most important things about this condition. An overview, presentation, testing meds, management, myasthenia crisis, cholinergic crisis, and the nursing seven where I break it all down. When we're talking about myasthenia gravis, think mind to ground. So basically what that means is, is that when you're looking at a person, the paralyzation happens from the head down to the ground. So what generally happens, and we'll talk about the symptomology about that a little bit later, but the basic principle is mind to ground. Well, that's different than Guillain-Barre. Well, Guillain-Barre is from ground to brain. And what's going on with the person with uh, myasthenia gravis? Well, it's all about acetylcholine. Now, acetylcholine is the way that we move muscles. And the way that we move muscles is this reuptake on the cells of acetylcholine. And what happens with that is that that's required for muscle movement. So when a person's walking around, they use up a lot of acetylcholine. And that's the general premise when you start to think about myasthenia gravis and medication management. Because they're going to get really, really weak. And they need the acetylcholine to move. Now the problem is, is that with, gilium, uh, with myasthenia gravis, is the reuptake of this acetylcholine is blocked. And so what happens is, is that this person doesn't have the bioavailability of acetylcholine that's necessary for muscle movement. And if they don't have that muscle movement, they tend to start to see paralyzation. And so that happens is, is that the patient will start to have this descending paralyzation, which is from the mind to the ground. Now there's two types, there's an ocular one which mainly stays up on the face and then there's a generalized one which will actually progress and the biggest issue is, is that they lose their respiratory drive and they actually end up on a ventilator and have these ex acute exacerbations. So let's get into this further when we talk about the presentation. So what does the patient look like for presentation? Well. Generally what happens is, is that for a person with myasthenia gravis is they're going to have um, some ptosis first, which is ptosis is basically a uh, drooping of the eyes. And what will happen is, is they might get some diplopia too, which is some double vision. And then what they're going to start to feel is, is that this kind of paralyzation in their face. And so they'll present with this kind of ptosis of their eyes. And so what will happen is, is that um, they'll recognize that there's a problem going on with this. And they'll, they'll go to the doctor. And then they'll be uh, getting assessed for They'll might question uh, myasthenia gravis, and what they'll do is what's called a tensilon test, which we'll talk about next. And when we're talking about diagnosing myasthenia gravis, it's basically that you know we know that the problem is with acetylcholine. And what we're trying to do is, is that we're going to do what's called a tensilon test. And this tensilon test is basically giving them acetylcholine, which allows for that acetylcholine to start to work. And what we said in previously is that they start to get this ptosis and they start to have this descending weakness. The big issue is that they start to have difficulty swallowing. And if it keeps on progressing, it starts to go down to the respiratory. And if it goes down to the respiratory, then all of a sudden that becomes an acute problem. So this progression... A lot of times it's try, we try to manage it. So the person comes into, into the doctor's office or the emergency room, and if we question myasthenia gravis, we're going to do the tensilon test. And that tensilon test is where we're going to administer this medication. And when we give this medication, it has a short half-life. And so what we expect to see with a person with myasthenia gravis, if they have ptosis, we'll expect them to get better. And all of a sudden this this droopiness will start to go away. And if it goes away, that's a positive tensilon test. And that's positive for uh, myasthenia gravis. Now the problem with that, the patient might feel that, wow, this is suddenly better and I feel better and this and the other thing. The problem is within about five minutes, that droopiness will return. And that's, that's what's called a positive tensilon test. Another thing about myasthenia gravis' presentation is some of the things that we worry about with myasthenia gravis is, is the respiratory. And when you're looking at ptosis and then this descending weakness, 
and they start to have difficulty swallowing, what happens is, is sometimes the underlying cause could be the thyroid. And there's something about the thyroid and the parathyroid is, is that sometimes people with tumors in this, um, they have a risk for myasthenia gravis. And what you, they'll tend to do with these patients, they'll do a thymectomy. So myasthenia gravis, a lot of times one of the treatments would be, let's take out the thyroid um, and give them supplemental thyroid medications. Because th they find out, they found out that the, uh, the risk is um, the thyroid might cause a problem. So what do we do for a patient with myasthenia gravis? Well, it depends if it's a respiratory problem because they could actually have, have a problem where they lose their respiratory drive. So we're always trying to prevent a patient from progressing further on down. Remember, it's descending weakness, which is different from guillain barre which is ascending weakness. So that's a big testing thing as far as identification of it. Also, Tensilon test. If they get better with Tensilon, then all of a sudden, um, that's a positive uh, myasthenia gravis. So then we're going to manage them on long-term uh, cholinergic medications. And what we're going to do is we're going to teach them about, you know, uh, conserving energy. Conserving energy because energy is muscle, and muscle means movement, which means decrease availability of acetylcholine, which could put a person into crisis. And All right, so what do we do for a chronic patient with um, myasthenia gravis? Well, we do a lot of teaching for this patient because they need to be aware that, you know what, their risk is is that this sending weakness continually goes down. And what happens is it goes actually to their lungs and they can actually become, have respiratory arrest. And so, th so that would be a problem and that's a cue. So what happens is, is that we teach them to have rest periods, to not use as much acetylcholine, um, also, when they take their medications, they take their medications at the same time. They don't double up on their medications. And um, if they miss their medication, they, they take it immediately. Um, also, the thing, too, is, is that we generally teach them to take meds and then within an hour do activities. And that will allow for that medication to be working. So we tend not to cluster. Um, activities with these patients because the use of acetylcholine tends to make them potentially go into crisis. So these patients tend to be uh, very managed very um, much with a lower activity level with their medications. Um, so generally you would give that medication first and then you would do your care with them. So they do their care mainly in the morning. Also they need to be aware of stress, infections, can cause uh, uses of acetylcholine, which then could cause problems with the acute, uh, with an acute myasthenia crisis. So the chronic conditions are basically managed through rest, medications, and teaching about uh, complications and when there is a problem. So that will bring us up to the next portion, which is the acute situation. With myasthenia gravis, the big thing to think about is when you're looking at the person, is that we're gonna have this patient with pitosis and, you know, I mean, kind of like a mask-like face. And the reason they have this mask-like face is because of, we're kind of keeping them at a level so it doesn't go down to their, because they need this medication, but, you know, we can't um, regulate it really well because of the person, we can't really know how often they're gonna use acetylcholine because that's problematic because every day, you might you use more energy than other days. You might have different stress more than other days. So what happens is, is that they put, get put on these uh, um, medications, these cholinergics, that then we are basically managing this patient on either two less of medications, which is myasthenia crisis, which is not enough medications, or cholinergic crisis, which is too much medications. And those that's the next two conditions that we're going to talk about. But if you understand this principle, once a person is chronic myasthenia crisis, my, myasthenia gravis, we're going to then manage that patient and then t teach them about the signs and symptoms of too much medications or too little medications and how will we know they're in each of those conditions. Okay, myasthenia gravis crisis. Not enough meds. Looks like slow, except BP and heart rate.
Okay, so what does a patient with myasthenia gravis crisis looks like? Well, that's pretty easy because they look like a patient who has the first onset of myasthenia gravis, which is ptosis, diplopia, and crisis is the problem is, is that it keeps on progressing. So they start to have dysphagia, they can't quite swallow, and then they start to have respiratory problems where they can't quite breathe, and that becomes an acute situation, and that's why it's a crisis. So what does the patient look like? Slow-like symptoms, right, except for blood pressure. Blood pressure goes really, really high, and heart rate goes really, really high. And that's because of parasympathetic sympathetic system that is in place with this. So what do we do for a patient with myasthenia cri crisis, gravis crisis? Well, if you remember the concept, it's they're missing medications. So the principle is, is that if we give them medications like Tensilon, and suddenly their symptoms get better, then they're in crisis. So that's generally the first rule, is, is that in a crisis on either a cholinergic or a myasthenia gravis crisis, you give a little Tensilon first, just to see, do, do the symptoms get better or do they get worse? Let's talk about the next patient, myasthenia gravis cholinergic crisis. Now cholinergic crisis is different because that's, and as we talked about it, we said that in myasthenia gravis, you either have a patient with either too much meds or too little meds. And a too little meds looks like, you know, what myasthenia gravis looks like. However, too much meds, well, too much meds looks like flat, fast-like symptoms. Fast-like symptoms, except for blood pressure and heart rate, which is low. And basically, if you think about cholinergics, now cholinergics, we, in in pulmonary, we have anticholinergics that we use, and they basically dry people up. So if you think dry-like symptoms, right? So anything that dries them up and slows things down, like constipation, decreased urinary output, dry mouth, dry eyes, that's anticholinergics. Well, cholinergics are fast-like symptoms and makes them wet. So think about uh, drooling. Um, teary eyes, okay, diarrhea, okay, so all these fast-like symptoms. Well, that's an airway problem, and that's why suctioning is necessary for these patients in airway. So they're in cholinergic crisis. They have too much meds on board. Why does that happen? Well, like I said before, it's a, it's a not perfect science as far as management of these symptoms. So when a person has a cholinergic crisis, they are fast-like symptoms, except their blood pressure is really, really low, and their heart rate starts to go low. So low that we, they need atropine, and they need dopamine to to deal with these blood pressures. That's different than myasthenia crisis, because myasthenia crisis are missing medications, and when they're missing medications, they have a hypertension and uh, tachycardia. So cholinergic crisis is everything is fast-like, except for the blood pressure and the heart rate are low. And that's because the parasympathetic sympathetic system. So what do we do? Well, we might give them, believe it or not, a uh, little tensile on because we're trying to evaluate is this really the problem if the symptoms get worse then they're in cholinergic crisis also um, we might start to do some piggy right which is plasmapheresis IgG and endophonium so plasmapheresis treats the volume inside the body and takes out the plasma and maybe slows down the antibodies from attacking IgG is to support the immunoglobulins, and endophonium is given as a, uh, a test to see whether or not this is a cholinergic crisis or this is myasthenia gravis. All right, let's pull it all together with myasthenia gravis. Well, the presentation is, is they could be walking around and suddenly start to have this ptosis and this droopy face that they start to recognize that they're having this difficulty seeing, diplopia. So that's kind of a good thing because they can have these presenting cyst symptoms. However, they can progress into difficulty swallowing and then uh, de decrease respiratory ar arrest and that becomes a problem. Uh, 
waiting in the office. They could be because they have this droop on here. A lot of times they'll go to the emergency room and they'll show up. What will we do? So those symptoms are specific on a, a new onset myasthenia gravis as they get the ptosis, diplopia, and uh, descending weakness. Um, they could be in the hospital, right? These patients can be admitted, uh, male and female, um, both sides, and they tend to peak out around 50s. Uh, so generally, anywhere between 30s to 55 tends to be the, the presentation. Precipitating factors, um, uh, choose your parents wisely. You don't really know when, who might get this. Uh, myasthenia gravis, main complication is respiratory. So how would, what's the acute three, what do we call? Well, if the pitosis actually starts to decrease and they actually have difficulty swallowing and they're having respiratory that arrest, that might be a problem. Um, also, we try to prevent this acute three from happening. Also, cholinergic crisis, where we talked about the medications, they have too much medication. So if they have start to have wet-like symptoms, you know, uh, drooling, um, eyes or their blood pressure starts to really plummet and their heart rate starts to plummet as in cholinergic crisis um, because too much medications are involved that doctor would need to be notified uh, be on a monitor of course with the heart rate and blood pressure blood pressure will be managing labs not necessarily um, some of the things that we might do to test this might be uh, what's called a uh, EMG so an EMG is more important for testing because of, it tests the muscle, right? And so with acetylcholine, when a person has acetylcholine um, problems, they keep on shocking this muscle. And what happens is eventually the muscle just flatlines. It doesn't react anymore. And that's usually positive for um, myasthenia gravis. Also positioning, high flowers, generally these respiratory, uh, EMG, um, antibodies, plasmapheresis, and no real uh, other than cholinergic medications like tensilons, endophonium, and stuff like that. Uh, temperature, uh, no pulse, definitely high or low depending on acute uh, crisis or cholinergic crisis. Respirations, high uh, blood pressure, either high or low depending on because myasthenia crisis, missing medications is hypertension and um, cholinergic crisis is hypotension and then mean arterial pressure low or high pulse ox no um, no fluid really is pulse no well reflexes will be um, more muscle they get tired very tired easily these patients a lot of times these patients can be if they survive the uh, respiration they can be discharged with further teaching. A lot of times they're sent into the ICU. If they have further complications, they can actually end up on a ventilator until that resolves itself. And depends on whether it's a, you know, myasthenia crisis or a um, cholinergic crisis. Well, that's about it. My name is Camp with Nursing Camp, and this is my myasthenia gravis lecture uh, from my study sheets found on Nursing Camp. Dot com or social media follow me there and we'll see you next time bye bye